ramp they go. This trip is going to be fun. The motors are starting. Fasten seat belts. Look, we're starting to take off. And then up, up into the air. We'd all like to think flying on an airliner is one big joyride. But it's essential that everyone around that plane works as a team. If any one person makes a mistake, it can be the beginning of the end. Clear to go, Northwest. Northwest Flight 255 started out like just about any other. It was 1987, a clear August day in Detroit. A plane load of passengers was urged to quickly take their seats. The pilots may have been in a rush to get the MD-80 jet into the air. One reason could be the 11 p.m. noise curfew at Southern California's John Wayne Airport, their final destination. The pilots started down the runway unaware their wing flaps weren't down. That meant this plane had no chance of flying. A hundred and fifty-six people died, including four infants, as the plane clipped light poles, smashed into a rental car building, and burst into flames on the freeway. And he just started banking left and right. There's this big wall of fire. The chief cause of accidents continues to be human error, very often crew error in the cockpit. Tim Neal is a spokesman for the Air Transport Association, which represents the major air carriers. Airlines don't like to see their planes go down in flames. Some of those problems are difficult to solve when you're talking about human failure. You know, why did somebody screw up? Why did they forget to do something? Uh, why did they compound the error? The key new thing I think that we're going to see in the years ahead is the monitoring of pilot performance during flight and analysis of that so we can see where we need to do some more work. Many studies say that more than six out of ten crashes are primarily the fault of the flight crew, the people flying the plane. According to the National Transportation Safety Board report, the probable cause of that Northwest tragedy was the failure to perform some of the most basic cockpit procedures. But only a year later, it happened again. Same problem, different airport. This time in Dallas, three pilots of Delta 1141 also forgot to set their flaps because they were chatting with a flight attendant. In this ironic twist, the black box recording foreshadows the tragedy to come. Okay. Discuss about the dating habits of our flight attendants so we can get it on the recorder, you know, in case we crash, that the media would have some kind of a juicy oh, is that right? Oh, is that what they look for? Yeah, you know that Continental that crashed in Denver? Yeah, they were talking about the dating habits of one of the flight attendants. We, we got to leave something for our wife and children to listen to. Now we're set. Engine estimates look good. Air speed's coming up both sides. The screams of passengers could be heard on the recording as the Boeing 727 hit the ground tail first and erupted in a fireball. Thirteen people died. All three pilots survived. What we've just seen is two cases of serious pilot error. But sometimes it's the skill and determination of a good pilot that's responsible for saving the lives of many passengers. There's no better example of that than United Airlines Flight 232. On 232, we were flying along on this beautiful July Wednesday afternoon, uh, the last day of a four-day trip for our crew. Jan Brown Lohr was a flight attendant on the DC-10 jet. She was heading home to Chicago July 19, 1989. And just out of the blue, this loud explosion, which was our number two engine. The uh, cockpit announcement was we had uh, shut down the number two engine and would be a few minutes late arriving at O'Hare. United Captain Denny Fitch began his journey as a passenger on Flight 232. 
Just outside of Sioux City, Iowa, the back engine exploded, cutting off all steering controls. The pilots were suddenly flying a plane that was, in layman's terms, like a car with no steering wheel and no brakes. The wide-bodied jet could fly on the remaining engines, but it couldn't be controlled and it couldn't land. Denny Fitch got out of his seat and went to the cockpit on a mission. What he saw was a captain and his crew in a life-or-death struggle. I said, would you like me to do the throttles? To which he agreed, and uh, for the next 30 minutes, I began my own research uh, laboratory. And I was ready to die if necessary. The next thing that came to my mind was a flight instructor I had years ago. And he basically taught me, never give up. Never, ever give up. And so with that mindset, I went to work for the next 30 minutes and tried to tame the beast. The following is an animated dramatization of the DC-10 crash using the actual black box recording and pilot dialogue. The runway was in our sights. Uh, we had it lined up. Uh, we were traveling so fast, we were traveling 250 miles an hour. <laughs> You could not have imagined how hard we hit. It was absolutely incredible. I, uh, I blacked out and there was shrieking metal on uh, noises that I had never heard or have heard since. The 400,000 pound plane splintered like a matchstick and set off an orange fireball that was seen for miles. Miraculously, 184 people lived through this unbelievable crash. The people I think about every morning when I step out of the shower and I see the scars on my body, and I think about both survivors and those that died. The 112 are in one seat, and the 184 that lived are in the other. And at all costs, they have to keep both seats out of the dirt every day. Some days are better than others, that's all. United lost one in, in Sioux City, and the, and the pilot saved a lot of lives, landed an airplane that had no control capability whatsoever. The amazing thing is when they put all the instructors and the test pilots in the simulator and duplicated it, they all crashed, and they couldn't do that. It's an amazing thing. Coming up later in the program, the showdown over child safety seats that might have saved the life of little Evan Sow.